A small park lies off a little bay, hugging the east coastal fringe of Sydney. Here, young men and children train to play the game of rugby league. They train for this weekly game, where you put all that has been rehearsed into action. There have been weekends like this for a hundred years in Clovelly. K grade grand final between Clovelly and St Charles, number eight. Hamilton, Hamilton is sold of his oh, is... Rugby league has been an essential part of these communities for generations. Together! Everything together. We run on together, we pack together, we get the ball up together, we make our tackles together. Every club has its story, but ours has been a century in the making. Before there was any Clavelli, there were the traditional landowners, the Gadigal and the Bidjigal, two of the 29 tribal groups forming the Eora Nation. The Eora people was the name given to the coastal Aboriginal peoples around Sydney, but little is known of them, although some relics can still be seen in the area. In the early part of last century, Clavelli was known as Little Kuji. It was renamed in 1913 after a tiny fishing village in Devon. It was not so dissimilar to his British cousin. Both were remote and, in the Aussie Clavelli's case, almost unreachable. In the 19th century, it was just a tiny hamlet in a lost corner of Sydney's eastern coastline. By the early 20th century, Clavelli slowly grew. A surf lifesaving brigade was formed in 1907, becoming one of Sydney's best and more people moved into this forgotten piece of paradise. Around 1909, major subdivisions for domestic housing commenced. Within three years, a tram line was operating, linking Clavelli to the rest of Sydney. This tiny hamlet, hidden in the 19th century, was becoming a bustling little village in the 20th. Public works commenced, industries such as tram manufacturing were nearby, and a suburb with its own distinctive coastal atmosphere was forming. To outsiders, Clavelli was often dismissed, nicknamed Poverty Point. The people were poor, but they grew close and loved their patch of beach. The small slither of coast had a strong beating heart. And then came the war to end all wars. A hundred years ago, Australia came out of the war having lost more young men per capita than any other nation. Returning soldiers were disheartened by what they had experienced lives had to be rebuilt. Rugby league was a tonic for young men disheartened by the war experience, but they were encouraged by the mateship that bonded them during the war. No other game allowed them to play it fair, but play it hard. The men of the Clavelli Lifesaving Brigade wanted something they could call their own. They wanted a game that set them apart from the ruling class. The game of rugby league offered them this freedom. Rugby league was the obvious way forward for the winter months and the game was already building momentum on the backs of the bigger clubs. This was a game that treated the men fairly, paid them properly and gave them a communal life. They weren't doing it for king and country, but for family and friends. This was, and still is, the way of suburban rugby league. From 1918, Clavelli was forging its own character. The village of 1909 was now becoming a strong community inspired by surf and sport. Suburbs we know today are some of the city's most wealthy, were at this time peopled by labourers, wharfies and itinerants. The eastern suburbs was dotted with rugby league clubs and the rivalry was fierce. Little is known about the early days of rugby league at Clavelli. A fire in the 1980s destroyed nearly all the club records. In 1935, Les Bryant ran the Clavelli Football Club. The colours were light blue and dark blue, representing the sea and the sky. We have Gazette articles and newspaper clippings of the time. We know that in the early 1930s, the club played as the Clavelli Seagulls. The team went on to win the B-grade competition in 1936 and was again successful in 1939. 
Many of these players went on to play first grade for either Souths or Easts. Play ceased during World War II. In 1945, a B-grade team entered into Easts Junior District League, sponsored by the Clavelli Surf Club. Butch Bottomley was the principal organiser of the 1945 team. He was assisted by Harry McEwen, who would preside over the club for the next 30 years. They trained on a grass plot where the kiosk now stands. The playing jersey at this time was blue with a red, white and navy blue V. Clavelli has always been about surf and turf. In fact, the interrelationship between the surf and rugby league clubs has been unbreakable. Those who were in the life-saving club in summer seamlessly moved into rugby league in the winter months. After the horror of the Second World War, life returned to near normality. At the time, the rugby league clubs were for adults and young men. Children played the game only in school, in weight divisions. Junior rugby league was yet to emerge. The 1940s and early 1950s was the era of legendary players like Butch Bottomley, Lenny Bennett and Arthur Manson. Warren Pegg remembers it as one of the best times to be a junior rugby league player. The A grade in uh, the Eastern Suburbs Junior League was the greatest junior league in Sydney. The amount of clubs that were in, involved and, and famous clubs like the Celebrity Club, the Wharfies, uh, the Dragons, Bondi United, Paddington Cold, Avalon. That's something I can just think of now. In fact, Jack Gibson started his career at the Celebrity Club, owned by Joe Taylor. Joe also owned Tomo's Two Up School, and Jack worked on the door at the Celebrity Club. But they had great battles with the Waterside Workers, and the, the Wolfies had Celebrity Club battle it out. But Clavelli always had an A grade side. Um, they were always competitive, but Clavelli always strived to get their four teams. There were four grades, and only the A grade teams were paid anything like a decent wage for their efforts. Five pound a win, uh, three pound a draw and two pound a loss. We had a good side, yeah, very good side. We got into the semis. Um, we were minor premiers. Um, there was a lot of gambling that went on. The Junior League was a, a rife place for big bets. If we won a game, you might get a, a handshake and be congratulated and there might be something left in your hand after the handshake. By the late 1950s, there was a push for lower age grades, E and younger. South Juniors emerged and were expanding. This soon began to catch on at Easts and elsewhere. Clavelli wanted to be part of the push. With this change came a new look for the club. Players loved to don the distinctive St George-like red and white jersey. St George was the greatest club of the time, but by today's standards, conditions were pretty primitive. Life as a whole had few complexities for young men who loved rugby league. For the injured, there was only one stretcher at Waverley Oval. The occasion that I can remember was that, that I was went for a, to kick a ball uh, and an opponent tried to kick the ball and I got there first and when, he, when I followed through, he kicked me right up the shin and just opened my shin right open and uh, I just looked down on it because I was a student at the time and I just held the, the wound together and the guy who was playing outside me at that stage, is outside centre, he came across and was a little bit um, squeamy about blood and he had one look at it and passed out and he got carried off in the stretcher and I had to walk off. Life in Clay Valley was, was very simple. It was football, swimming and cricket. We played cricket in the, in the streets, football up at Burroughs, going to the park it used to be a the challenge in itself, we used to pass the football across the road from one side to the other for points. Anyone that dropped the ball would lose a point. And that became a, a challenge in itself every, every day. We learnt to pass straight, hard, fast, and that was the way Dad taught us. Behind the growth and new look for the club was President Harry McEwen and coaches Keith Goodsell Dave Hunter and a little later, Arthur Manson. 
These men were a new generation of coaches that had vision and passion for the game. They realised this was more than a game. It was a vehicle not only for fitness, but as a social glue for a community and as a means to build standards of discipline for young men growing up in the area. The Manson family has offered three generations of players to the club. We know that there were members of the Manson family playing in the 1920s. Arthur Manson, who later returned as a successful coach and club president, played in the late 1940s and 1950s, and his son Ian was a junior grade player in the 1970s and 1980s. Mark Preston, who played in the 1970s and 1980s, remembers his coach Arthur Manson as a solid coach who taught the fundamentals. He was only a short, stocky guy, but uh, he had a voice that you could hear from one end of Burroughs Park to the other, and if you if you've crossed him, uh, you knew it. Tough but fit, and, and, and got results. Keith Goodsell was the surf club captain. He took the surf and turf idea to the max, handpicking teams and finding talent in schools wherever he could. He made sure that if you were in the surf club, you were in the leagues club. Everybody stayed together. Dad was the sort of person that uh, he, he, he just wanted to help the kids all the time. He didn't have a, a, a very good life as, as a boy and he wanted to make sure that everyone else coming through he, under his guidance had a better life than what he had. In training when I was only eight or nine, uh, up at Burroughs Park he'd sit on me, on, on me neck and make me lift him up to build up my muscles around my shoulders and neck and thank God he did because I could lift a scrum by myself. In 1960, it was decided that Burroughs Park would be the home ground for Cavelli. It was the site of an old fortification from the 1890s and the kids had been using it as a playground for decades. Two stalwarts of Clavelli, Keith Goodsell and club president Harry McEwen, realised Burroughs Park was perfect for a home ground. In the early 1960s, the bowling club was expanding and it seemed only natural to redevelop the lower sand dunes into a football field. A changing shed could also be built from the bowling club's leftover materials. Dad was uh, the one that got Burroughs Park going. Dad was beach inspector at Clovelly Beach and he asked the council to clear the land up at, up at Burroughs Park. They planted grass and Dad watered it every day for probably 12 months till the grass grew. Dad never gave up. Keith Gossel was just an incredible human being. Just a great bloke. Actually, um, he had a big impact on a lot of our lives. Um, but I'll, I'll get back to that in a sec. Okay? I'm sorry. Goodsell was a teetotaler and a fitness fanatic who would go on to nurture a new generation of great footballers whom he would oversee for the next decade. Many of Goodsell's protégés would go on to play junior representative football and ultimately make the grade for the Eastern Suburbs Club. Clavelli was a club on the move, building great players for the highest levels of the game. Uh, Kevin Bottomley said to me once, he said, where do you want to, where do you want to go when he tried to instill confidence in the players? He said, where do you want to play? I said, I want to play for East. And that was my goal, to play for East somewhere along the way. And, um, and I think that was most, most of uh, young players' dreams. As the game developed and rugby league became the state's biggest winter sport, Clavelli moved into the big time. The 1961 side, one of the club's most successful ever, was due to tour Perth. But there was a shortfall. The club needed £2,500 to get there. The easiest way to make up the funds was to have an illegal betting night. Dad hired the, the Chinese restaurant opposite the Chloe pub for the night, invited Perth and and all the uh, illegal gambling casino for people. The most money they got was from the person, who the Chinese person who, were in, who owned the, the restaurant. He gambled so much that he actually lost the restaurant to my dad and the Chloe Football Club. And at the end of the night, dad gave it back to me. Coach Dave Hunter emerged at around this time 
and he was to nurture the next generation of young men into the 1960s and 1970s, including Brian Garland, Andy Kelly, Ronnie Simpson, Jeff Broadstock, and many other club legends. There were great competitive teams in this period, from the early 1960s right into the early 1970s, and the club won numerous grand finals in various grades. It was a golden era for the Clavelli Club. It was the inspiring Keith Goodsell who used to have his players run repeated laps of the Oval. Keith changed the face of football, like, you know, in Clavelli. He had a great squad. Uh, Keith, Keith was a bit different. He was probably a, a man before he, or a coach before his time, but he drooled into us. Um, fitness and and that was that was one of the big reasons why we, we won so many competitions uh, if my memory serves me right on 59 uh, we won the eastern suburbs competition 60 we got beat in the grand final in south sydney 61 we won the competition in western suburbs uh, 62 and 63, we won the um, Eastern Suburbs Junior League competition. And then uh, I think 63, Kenny McMorrow, uh, who was a former Eastern Suburbs uh, first grade halfback, um, uh, he coached us and uh, we won, uh, I think, two competitions and lost one with, with Kenny. It didn't matter how hard he pushed the kids. All the players loved Keith and the late Kenny McMorrow, whom they called Second Fathers. Scott Bennett remembers the aura around Ken McMorrow in the 70s. There is a name that is Clovelly through and through. It's Ken McMorrow. My first memory of Ken is being in Clovelly Surf Club and my dad and Ken talking with each other. And then dad coming up, I must have been very young, and dad coming up and says, you know that man there? That man played for the Roosters and I looked, I looked at him and I just thought, he's only my size and I would have been about eight years old. My confidence was always stronger after talking with Ken. He was a very positive man and always, always nipping around. I could imagine him playing as a nippy little halfback and, you know, snapping at the heels of those forwards. He was a lovely man, Ken McMorrow. Lenny Bennett was a bloke, so I played my first game and last game for Cloverly with Lenny. Kenny McMorrow, I believe, was the toughest halfback I've ever seen. I, he'd be lucky to, to, to weigh nine and a half stone, and then you pick him up like a rag doll and throw him against the wall. But the buildings he took in the eastern suburbs was, was amazing. Never complained, and, uh, and a fine, fine halfback as well. When the 1965 C-grade Grand Final came along, Mayhew found he was in the midst of a dilemma. Did he play a semi-final for East Reserves that day, or did he return to play in the C-grade Grand Final against Bondi United with his Clavelli mates? I went to Kenny and his wife Val, uh, for hopefully uh, to, to, to try and find a, a, a solution to the, to the problem and all as, all as they said were, well, Graham, whatever you decide, uh, we'll back you. So uh, while it was a lovely uh, uh, answer, I, um, I, I was cursing, <laughs> cursing them, <laughs> God bless them. But um, uh, as it turned out, Eastern Suburbs didn't make the, uh, they got beat in that last uh, game and didn't make the uh, semi-finals and uh, I was able to play in the grand final, which we got beat anyway. I was, I was fortunate to, to play in three winning grand final sides and one losing one. I can still remember when we lost and was playing up at, I know it sounds crazy, but, but I can still remember when we lost and was playing at Waverley Oval. I walked off there and I just had, I had the absolute shits. I just couldn't believe we got beaten. But uh, we got beaten by a better team on the day. Who kept it all afloat in those years? For nearly three decades, the financial backing came from Harry McEwen, an independently wealthy man whose house overlooked Clavelli Beach. He was always there for Clavelli until his death in the mid-1970s. He was an enigmatic figure except when it came to Clavelli, which was his greatest passion. He was a well-known bookie in Randwick 
and was most beloved for his total devotion to the club, their players and families. Harry McEwen was Mr. Clavelli. He was like a grandfather to me. He wore a suit and collar and tie, which they did in the old days, to every game. When we won the first competition and he got his blazer, uh, he never took it off. I don't think ever after that. He wore it every day. He was something special to me. Clover Lee would never be around without Harry McEwen. Harry McEwen, um, who was the president of the club, was a very kind person, a uh, very quiet person, uh, did a lot for the club, financed a lot of the, the businesses. Uh, and Harry had a good business on the side and uh, was able to finance a few things. Gambling was, a, was quite a thing in, in uh, Sydney in those days. He was a very quiet man, he helped a lot of people. He helped my grandmother and grandfather with just taxi money to get me back and forth. Uh, from uh, football games. Never thought about who financed the club, who paid for the jumpers or the shorts or the socks. I know we only got one of each and it had to last you the season. And if you lost it, you had to, it's like an inquest to get a second pair. And um, if you damaged it, uh, they usually patched it up. <laughs> so you got your jumper and that was it. And if you're a real good boy, they gave it to you at the end of the season. We, we were unbeatable. Harry McEwen once put up probably about $1,000 at the time for anyone to take us on and uh, try and beat us. We, we played Liverpool and we played a few others, but uh, no, one, no one could beat us. In the 1960s and 70s, there was a new lure for kids to become rugby league stars. Clovelly was already a strong feeder to the Eastern Suburbs Club and some of its players were in contention for representative honours. There were some greats of the period. Names which still resonate like Des O'Reilly, who played for Easts and New South Wales. Paul Cross. Graham Mayhew. Union International Phil Smith. International Surf Club champion Bob Green. Colin Campbell and Ken McMorrow. Even back then, the Clavelli bond was strong. Once you played for Clavelli, you were always one of them, even if you ended up playing for an opposing side. McMorrow remembers playing against Ron Sadlow in 1960. Sadlow, a former East and Clavelli's junior, was playing on the opposing team. I made a break and I heard, yeah, Kenny, watch out. And I ducked my head. And a coat hanger went over me. <laughs> coat hanger went over me. Head. I looked around. I was running. I went, Ronnie Clavelli. <laughs> there was plenty of high jinks on and off the field in the formative years of rugby league. Graham Walker remembers the speed of Paul Cross. Nobody in the opposition could catch him. So on one occasion, they resorted to other tactics. We got the ball to Cross and he's flying down the wing and Bobby Crotty's standing on the sideline. And that's Paul Cross is flying down the wing, ready to, to cross inside and put the ball down underneath the post. Bobby Crotty's hooked him with the umbrella right around the ankle and dropped Crossy flat in his face. <coughs> and the brawl, brawls erupted and the referees walked off the field and, did, and abandoned the game. And the next time we played them, we played them behind a picket fence up at uh, Waverley Oval, so there was no spectators around. <laughs> But it was an absolute riot. <laughs> there were players that made a huge mark around this time. Des O'Reilly, the great Eastern Suburbs second rower, arrived at Clavelli in 1969 as a fresh 15 year old. Clavelli was the natural choice. Once he came to Clavelli, he never went back to Bondi. He trained harder than, the, than everyone else. He got the training early, he did extra stuff after. Um, he, you know, he wasn't a fancy player, but he was non-stop perpetual motion for that, that whole period. You, Des was always the first guy you wanted, me as a lazy front rower, Des was always the guy you wanted to pick to uh, do your tackling. 
he made you look good. He made us look good, that's right. I, I was happy to run with the ball and, and have Des, Des do all my tackling. Since its formation in 1918, there was one thing Clavelli didn't have, a winning A-grade grand final team. That changed in 1970 and 1971, when the side won the grand final in both years, and they were all coached by one of Clavelli's toughest ever, Dave Hunter. Oh, he was so stern, he'd give you a stern look. Uh, and he was the coach of the 1970 A grade side that, that won the Premiership, which was a pretty hard thing to do in those days. And his coaching method was that if you had an argument with him, he'd take you out the back of the dressing sheds. And say, you, you first. You could win a game by 20 points, but if he wasn't satisfied what you'd done on the day, he'd have you down what we call the horror course on Tuesday night, which was a northwestern corner of um, Burroughs Park, which he'd run up one side, down the other, and in a little triangle, probably 45 to 50 minutes at a time, and you'd be absolutely buggered by the time you were finished. So that was your punishment. <laughs> Dave Hunter, he's synonymous with Clovelly to me, and next comes Arthur Manson. They were the two rocks at my time at Clovelly. Ronnie Simpson played 177 games for the club, five of which were grand final wins. The most memorable being the young 1970 A-grade winning team. When we were on 15-13, that's how close it was, we won that competition. Pat O'Colts that day had about six or seven X-grade players in there. They were 20 to one on to win the competition. They won everything. They won the semi-final to get in the grand final, something like about 20, 30 points. We scraped in, we had no hope, we not in the squad. There was something like the 12 or 13 B graders. That's why I was so emotional. The best part was that everyone jumped the fence, and, and I've never seen it before. Like, supporters just jumped the fence when the full time siren went, and it was all the bell, and it was just incredible. It was just emotional. We all went back in the dressing room, and I think the yelling went for about 45 minutes non stop, just cheering and cheering and cheering. It was even more so for club president Harry McEwen. He always wanted to win an A grade grand final. And the year he, we did win it, he actually received the trophy from the um, president of the Junior Rugby League for Eastern Suburbs on our behalf. Oh, you could almost see the tears in his eyes at the time. He, he was elated. At the same time, people were saying there was some kind of magic about Chloe. Every local kid wanted to play for the club and grab that jersey. The media was in on the act too. You could watch Controversy Corner with Rex Mossop or listen to Frank Hyde on the radio. Rugby league was big time in the eastern states. The same buzz was there at Clavelli. Many Clavelli players had become household names and every kid in the area wanted to be like them. At the highest level, the competition between some teams was ferocious. The C-grade team won the 1982 final against their biggest rivals, the Eastern Suburbs Catholic Club, who had beaten Clavelli by a point in the semi. The boys had a point to prove in the final. When we won the grand final, we, we painted the road outside the Clavelli Hotel. We won 26 nil in big, bold letters, and it lasted, it lasted on the road for about six months. It was a, it was a good party time. A-grade coach Tony Moses remembers losing by a point in the grand final against Coogee Bay in 1983 under dubious circumstances. A couple of people told me that things aren't quite what they're going to be and we need to win decisively, otherwise we might battle. The standard then in, in A-grade was, was pretty serious. It's regrettable for the club that, um, and myself, I would have loved to have won it, you know. But, um, which is a feather in my cap that I never ever got, but it would have been nice to have won for both reasons, but more so the club. Since the 1940s, the Clavelli Club was referred to as the Bay, or just Bays. In 1983, the club wanted and needed to refresh its image with a new name. People often ask about the origins of the name Crocodiles. I just said you're performing like a you're performing like a, like a team of fucking crocodiles. And uh, I said, that's not gonna get it done. 
And uh, I said, do you understand what I'm talking about here? I said, crocodiles. I said, they just lay there. They don't look at anybody else. They just do their own thing. I said, that's what you blokes are doing. And now it's, uh, it's everywhere. But it was, a, it was an innocent throwaway line that, um, that became something pretty serious. <laughs> and there you have it. The Clay Valley Crocodiles, it was, there was nothing premeditated about it. It just, uh, it just blurbled out and, um, and yeah, it's been good. It stuck. The Clay Valley Crocodile. And here are their sponsors. They're sponsored by the Grand Clay Valley, the Charing Cross Hotels, uh, Jimac SA, Clay Valley Auto Port and Warlords. Thanks around that little boat from WR for a winger. Right, Lewis gets it to McShane. McShane on to Anderson. Anderson shuffles, comes back down the middle. By the mid to late 1980s, the times were changing. Soccer, rugby union and basketball were now competing with rugby league. It was not always the first choice sport for local kids, as it had been for previous generations. To cap it all, the club was going through a tough phase. There was negativity about the violence of rugby league. By the early 1990s, the club was at crisis point. Linda McIntosh, who describes herself as being dragged into coaching, remembers how difficult it was to get enough junior players to make up the teams, let alone find enough people to run the club. This is where the exhausting bit comes in, because it was sort of, who will do this job, who will do that job, and uh, at, at one stage there it got down to my husband and I and one other person, and my husband said, well, I'll be the treasurer, and Dapix said, well, I'll be the president, so that all the positions were filled by virtually three to four people. You know, we're at the point of folding if we can't, you know, my husband and I can't keep doing this. We can't keep working our own jobs with our own family and our own commitments and trying to run this football club full time. Just as they had before, the local families entered the fray providing much needed support. When the Crocs needed junior personnel, the locals responded. Sid Eckstein, who was part of the committee in 1994, realised that Clavelli had to rebuild the team from the bottom up. I think at the ages of six, seven and nine, that's what we were looking at at the time, to number one, increase the numbers in those age groups, therefore you had to make it a family friendly club. And that's why the, the growth of the club really came about from the under sixes up. Well, some people look at uh, having an A grade, uh, we look at it the other way. We don't care about the A grade. If the A grade comes, that's a bonus. But if you don't have, if you don't build from sixes up, uh, the club will just have one or two teams or three teams. It'll never grow. You might lose them at a later age. Uh, at least you've got eight, 10, 12 teams in your club and you've actually got a club and the kids feel a part of that. New blood came in. Drew Brabin, an army officer, joined the club. He, together with Philip Michael, brought in new ideas and initiatives and restructured the club. Brad Peterson, a former player, was asked to coach the under sixes and couldn't believe the state of the club when he arrived. When I got down to the field, uh, I found they only had two teams, a, a sixes and a sevens, 17 players in total. Clavelli was a might smaller club than when I used to play. Anyway, through that, we had a good president and vice president who did a, a business development course, applied it to the club, and within about a 10-year period, we had 23 or 24 teams. During this rebuilding phase in the late 1990s, the man who lived, breathed and loved Clavelli returned. After more than two decades, Keith Goodsell offered his services and Clavelli was only too happy to accept him. Clavelli's prodigal son had returned. Keith, when I started coaching back at Clovelly, I noticed used to walk past on his afternoon walks and stop at the fence and just watch the boys. I called him over, hey, Keith, can you come over here and give me a hand? I need your help. Anyway, Keith came over and then was there every Thursday. <laughs> Kept giving a hand for that uh, season and then convinced him to coach a side the following year. At this stage of his life, he was probably in his late 70s, early 80s. Um, he coached for several years after that, and all the kids called him Pop. Clavelli had re-established itself as one of the principal junior rugby league clubs in the eastern suburbs. In 2004, the club was lucky enough to bring in Sean Kenny Dow, a current Kiwi international, who showed his potential as soon as he ran on the field. From the word go, 
There was just something about Sean that was just unbelievable. And during the season, he played a, a reserve grade. Uh, he scored three tries in the blink of an eye. It was just amazing. And that was a, like a seven, 16, 17 year old playing A reserve grade. In all my years at Clavelli and dealing with kids, I've never seen a footballer who was so level headed and so humble. And we're so glad that he came to Clavelli and made a great career at the Roosters from such humble beginnings. And myself personally, I've you know, met a lot of great people at the club and you know, Sid Eckstein and Anna Morata and um, you know, Andrew Monaghan, they're you know, great stalwarts of the Clay Valley Crocodiles and you know, they've really helped me still really cherish those friendships and relationships that I have with those people now. Accepting us as you know, young 15 year olds and it really created a platform for me to you know, reach my highest goals and, and my potential. The club has never looked stronger, but there are challenges. Club coach Adrian Lamb says that there will always be competition for kids in the area and Clavelli has to remain aggressive in promoting its values. Clavelli isn't the biggest region and, and, and so we have our challenges there as well but then we've got, uh, because it's, it's the Silvertail area as they say, uh, we've got all the private schools around too that, that promote rugby union. So not only have we got the challenge of not having a lot of children in the area but we also have another sport that's very aggressive at securing the services of these young uh, players and men. What's our sport about? What's rugby league about? Rugby league's about getting participants in at a younger age to give them an opportunity to have the experience of playing in teams, uh, weekly competitions, and just to get them off the street really. I found this out of my rugby league experience that you've got to be capable of playing for each other. Now that, that might sound so simple, but you've got to train like that got to live like that. I said it's got to be part and parcel of you. And you're going to be lucky enough to play with a group of guys, play for each other, that carries on to the modern day. Teams that play for each other are successful to each other. If you go out and you really play for each other, the other team have got to play that much higher. And you've got to raise their standards. Even though we want to evolve the game into the, a new level, it's always the basic little you know, structures that, that are m most successful. Running hard. Running hard and tackling hard. Things really? don't change. You know how hard it is to coach someone to run hard? <laughs> and for them to listen and actually physically do it, change, it's, it's difficult, you know, it's really difficult. When the young child watches rugby league, I think that it takes them to a different place, you know, and, and they, they want to be that player or that person or be in that moment. And I, I guess, again, this is why rugby league is such a great sport, because it allows them to be like the person that they look up to. It allows them to be a part of a, a, a team, you know, and there's a lot of lessons to be learned along the way there in, in life in general, whether it's, you know, mateship or respect or uh, teammates and, and working hard together as a group, never giving up, your ability to believe in yourself. To describe my time at Clovelly um, Junior Rugby League Football Club would be to say it was exhausting, <laughs> exhilarating, ups and downs, sometimes stressful, but ultimately rewarding. Rewarding just to see little kids that when you first threw the ball at them were too scared to catch it, running and scoring tries. And you know, you just got such a big kick boy that I didn't recognise that was now nearly eye level with me would come up and say, hi Linda, do you remember me? I'm Jamie, you coached me. But I used to say to them that um, the memories of today you'll carry for the rest of your life. You'll never forget it if you lose and you'll never forget it if you win. But more importantly, I said, look at the black beside you. I said, if you let him down, he'll never forget you. You're playing here, I said, for a lifetime of memories. While watching these kids, it's a lot of little victories. Watching a lot of little victories. And that's what all that age football should be. You know, your first tackle, your first run, your first try, your first pass, your first catch, your first time you beat the opposition. That, that's a big thrill for a lot of the kids. Instead of getting bashed up, <laughs> jumped on, Jeez, I'm through the hole. What do I do now? To think that a rugby league club can last 100 years in Sydney uh, is magnificent, particularly in eastern suburbs, where the culture changed over so many years. 
To think that Clavelli is still there with the stalwarts like Bondi United and Paddington Colts, that they have lasted, is an absolute credit to the management and to the players and to the people that helped that club go. And I'm just so thrilled. As a family historian, and I belong to a few history groups, I just think this is fabulous that it's made this milestone 100 years and sadly I won't be here for the 200 years but I hope that it's still here in 200 years. You know, McClave, I, mean, it's, 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 it's a, I think it's a remarkable feat. Players come and go. In terms of the administration, they should, uh, they should be well applauded for their efforts in keeping the, uh, keeping the dream alive. It's great to know that they're still going and giving the kids an opportunity and hopefully they'll, they'll go for another 100 years. For the community to be strong and, and support and have our volunteers turn up there week in, week out to make this great club um, continue over this amount of time is, is a true, true um, you know, sign of greatness to a, to a little you know, uh, club in, in, on the beach. The Clavelli Crocs is a rare rugby league club with a century of little victories. It is a club that has endured while others have faded away. It continues the hopes and dreams and possibilities for this small beachside community playing the greatest game of all, rugby league.